Everyone has a story. It may not be you, it may not be your spouse, but unfortunately, nobody has avoided it completely. Tonight, a group of extraordinary women. Chelsea Clinton, Raquel Stevens, Midge Purse, Glenn Close. Highlight the mental health epidemic. We say ignore all these factors. There's something in your mind that you're struggling with. And I think that's so neglectful because we're not addressing the root of the problem. Through music. We are bursting through the barricades and we're reaching for the sun. We are warriors, yeah, that's what we've become. Insightful conversation. I have always had people whose names I don't know come up and say to me, wouldn't it be great if you weren't here? She came up to me and she said, I need your help. I can't stop thinking about killing myself. And understanding. Imagine her life being, you know, one of the most famous people in the world. And it can feel extremely, extremely overwhelming. It might take a village, but this is how we change the world. Please enjoy, but please remember, we're in this together. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. Thank you so much, Harris, for assembling this, for making this happen, and for inviting us all. It's an honor, it really is. It's a privilege to be here tonight. Tonight, I hope we open some eyes, hope we shed some light, hope we move the conversation forward. That's what it's all about. It is critical. I want to start with some data points to keep in mind as we move forward here. One in five women in this country has a mental health condition. Women are twice as likely as men to suffer from depression. None of this is normal. None of this is OK. And clearly, we need to attack this and fix it. So that's what we're going to try to start doing, or at least get on the road toward doing that tonight. And I want to talk about your journeys, each of your individual's mental health journeys. And Glenn, I want to start with you. And you became really vocal on mental health in a very personal way, your own family involving your sister and her son. Take us through that. Yes. So um, my sister, Jessie, who's the youngest of four, was always considered the wild one. She walked out of, of school uh, in ninth grade. Uh, she was under the care of my older sister at the time out in California. She never went back. Um, my dad said, my dad, who was a, actually a brilliant physician, Columbia trained surgeon, would say to Jesse, pull up your socks, you know, get a job, finish your education. And somehow Jesse never could. Um, she had, she married, she had two children. Um, and one summer when I was visiting mom and dad and Jess was there, just before she left, she came up to me and she said, I need your help. I can't stop thinking about killing myself. It was the first time I had ever heard that. Um, it, it was shocking. And um, I had no clue. Um, my mom and I got her help. She went to McLean Hospital for about five months, where she was finally properly diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, before that, actually, her son had had a psychotic break when he was 18, 19, um, and he was at McLean's for two years and, and uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia, well, schizoaffective disorder, which is a combination of the two. But even after Kaylin was the first one in our family to be diagnosed, we didn't have any clue. Nobody talked about it. Um, I visited him, and it was a little uncomfortable, and you didn't quite know what to say. And there were people kind of behaving strangely, sitting with him on the porch of, of the residence that he was in. And then Jesse came to me, and my life changed after that. When they were learning how to maintain their illnesses, which is a huge challenge. They asked me to do something about the stigma because they had already experienced it. Kalen, who was a beautiful young man, the head of the gang always, when he came out of the hospital, none of his friends came back to him. None of them. Jesse was terrified that if the mother of one of her little girls uh, friends found out that she had bipolar disorder, that they wouldn't be allowed to come over to play. She found it very hard to get out of her house. And the shame, the sense of, 
of being sidelined um, was overwhelming. So we, I said, I'd love to help. I'm not sure how, but I'm not going to do it without you because it's not about me, it's about you. And so we decided that the most important thing was to start talking about it because our family had no vocabulary for mental illness, none. So we founded an organization called Bring Change to Mind in, in 2010. And Jesse and Kaylin, when we, when we rolled it out, went on national television, four or five shows, saying, I have bipolar disorder, or I live with bipolar disorder. It was so courageous. It, that was almost 11 years ago. Well, what was the reaction, Glenn? The reaction was gratitude, I think. I think the most overwhelming reaction was people saying, I know someone or someone in my family. Um, some people would come up to me and whisper, you know, my, there's somebody in my family. And I'd say, um, who and what is their diagnosis? To try to just talk about it. Because I think mental health, mental illness, is, is, it's, it's a human condition. You know, it's, it's who we are. It's our incredible brains that are so delicate. Um, so it's something that we should um, embrace and um, find the ways where people who have been diagnosed are not marginalized or shamed. And they, my, my nephew is a wonderful artist. He's a painter. Jesse has written three books, one of them called Resilience, about her whole life with bipolar disorder. Um, the, the waste of people who are suffering with mental illness who have not gotten the proper help is, is staggering. And I think if we embrace the idea that they are not to bring them in and to let them find, you know, their role in life, you know, with the, uh, the illnesses that they're dealing with. Um, yeah. We'll come back to um, the centers that you've created and what they're doing with people um, around the country, right? I want to talk about that. That sounds really, really amazing. Um, Raquel, Harris started to talk about my mind and me, the story of Selena Gomez and the documentary that was produced under that name. And you're in it as well, and you're her dear friend. If you haven't seen this documentary, run to see it. It is amazing. It is so powerful and so strong. But at one point, Selena is, is by herself, and she goes, it's just so hard being an effing girl, right? Now, she might have been referring to a wardrobe change at that moment or something minor or superficial but it was also emblematic of everything that was going on in her life. It's a tough, tough journey that she's been through, and you've been right there. Yeah. What's that like? How did you get your head around it, and how's she and you doing uh, right now? <laughs> well, it's been a journey. Um, it was a you know, seven-year process making the documentary, and I had the privilege of being a producer on it, um, which was amazing, but what was even more amazing is doing the friendship journey with Selena for over a decade. And I don't know if anyone in this room knows what it's like to be close to someone that's struggling with a mental illness, but it can be really hard because you care and there's not always an answer. And um, Selena so bravely chose to share her story in this documentary, to be vulnerable, to be real, to share things that you know, others maybe might not be comfortable sharing, understandably so, but what I admire so much about Selena is that she's always understood that her platform was not just for herself, but it was so that she could share her journey with others to help them. And um, we're both doing good now. Um, in the documentary, you can see a lot of what we showed was our friendship. We thought it was really important to show real, authentic friendship in the documentary. And she's been really committed to getting the help and, and staying on track. And, and she's doing wonderful, yeah. But it's so striking. Here's someone who's so talented, who has it all, who's touching people's lives on a daily basis with her work, and yet she feels like she's not good enough. Yeah. She keeps saying that. And, yeah. and a normal reaction from anyone else, including you, is like, come on, you got it all, you got this. But that's a tough dynamic to navigate. How did you get, how did you, you know, what was the arc of that? Where did you start and where are you now with that? 
Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, you know, her say it's so hard being a girl. I think that we can all relate to that. And then now imagine her life being, you know, one of the most famous people in the world and you've got all these eyes on you and it can feel extremely, extremely overwhelming. And I think we got through it through constantly having those tough conversations, right? Through constantly pushing through to the end goal, which was ultimately, I wanna use this, all the hard stuff, all the messy stuff to help others. And um, so I think we got through it through friendship, right? Through, through conversation. And I think that that's why doing, you know, events like this are so important is because we're meant to do life together, right? We're not meant to do it alone and we all have struggles you know some mental some it could be anything right but we need each other and so that's how we got through it was through relationship and she trusts you to be honest yeah because some well, of the viewers saw parts of the film and thought she's being brutal you're being brutal to her that's not that's not nice that's not okay but it was quite the opposite right it's quite the opposite i mean how do we grow if we don't have people being real and honest with us right and i welcome that in my life and i think it's amazing that selena welcomes that in hers as well and i think that you know, real, authentic, honest friendship. That's how we grow. I don't want people always telling me what I want to hear. I want them telling me the truth. And um, so I, I was grateful that we chose to show that in the documentary because I think it's important uh, for people to see that. Major, there's a lot to talk about in your career. Pro soccer player, one of the best around, playing for the U.S. national team as well as the New York team, right? Um, New York, New Jersey team. You're on a mission to get equal pay for women. That in and of itself is, I mean, one of those things where you go, really? How, how can that be? How does that weigh on you from a mental health perspective? It's heavier on my bank account <laughs> <laughs> than it is on my mental. And that, that really is where all of the drive comes from. I think a lot of the time, when the women are speaking about equal pay, everyone's talking about like these emotional responses, like, oh my gosh, you're such an example, you're an inspiration, and we're just, we're just trying to get paid. <laughs> like, that's why we're actually here. You wanna eat. Yeah, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and um, essentially, most of it was really rewarding. I think a lot of people expect me to say it was super exhausting, and it was in a way, but this was a generational fight. I, I was closing a fight that has been go going on for four or five generations of women who had circumstances and playing environments that I can't even fathom. So when I was speaking to them and complaining about my per diem's not enough, like we're playing on turf. They're like, we were paying for our own flights. Like we were paying for our own jerseys. And we hear the, the story of equal pay and like how you're getting little by little by little and we're celebrating these little wins that really in the grand scheme of things don't mean that much to finally do a historical iconic groundbreaking we've achieved equal pay as the first team in the world it was it was great how's your bank account it's nice <laughs> that's why chelsea how did you come to recognize um mental health as the crisis it, that it is globally i mean Personally, you've been through a lot of fires yourself and you've had to steel yourself against a lot of incoming. Um, how, what's your journey? I have always been uh, mindful of both the extraordinary gifts that my life has given me and opportunities and privileges and also the somewhat unique challenges um, that my life has um, asked me to navigate. And I'm incredibly thankful and mindful, particularly now as a parent, um, that I had parents and grandparents um, who always ensured that I knew I was loved, that knew I was um, safe, that I was emotionally safe and psychologically safe, as well as thankfully physically safe, um, and that I always had people who were there to listen without judgment and with infinite kind of patience and time and kind of the the generosity of of space and and guidance and real kind of community because as we've heard you know this evening already you know, we are not meant to go through this life alone and i am so thankful that i have never felt alone that even as an only child um, of my parents with 
uh, for whom I'm very proud, uh, but who certainly took me on a number of journeys in my life, um, that I never felt, uh, I never felt alone. I am deeply aware of how lucky I've been because it is really the luck of nurture and nature um, that I, I believe have the good mental health that I do have. Um, and I deserve only, I think, a little bit of credit for that. And I think my parents and my grandparents deserve a lot of that credit. A little more than a little bit, I think. And oh, someone will come running, and I know they'll take you home even when the dark comes crashing through when you need a friend to carry you when you're broken on the ground you will be found so let the sun come streaming in you'll reach up and you'll rise again lift your head You talked about young people. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you all saw the Surgeon General's report. Just a quick summary. The Surgeon General said social media presents a profound risk to our kids. 95% of teenagers are on there. A third say they use it constantly. One in four girls say they experience negative social pressure and the need to show the best versions of themselves. I think it's more than one in four, to be honest with you. I think it's everybody. Um, you get anxiety. I do, just by looking at social media. Um, Raquel, you talk about how social media posts are just a snapshot of life. You have a realistic look at it. It's not necessarily reflecting reality. How do we get teenage girls to fully grasp that? So part of the reason I wrote my book, which is here, The Sunshine Mind, was because I felt it was so important to write specifically for younger girls. Um, I'm close with a lot of my little cousins, and I was talking to them about the pressures they were facing with TikTok and Instagram. and not feeling good enough or not getting enough likes or comparing themselves to this person or that person. And um, what I found is that when we prioritize our inner life, when we make that strong at any age, but if we can start it younger, even better, um, then we can handle this world. And the truth is social media, it's not going anywhere. It's just gonna continue to grow. So how do we develop a healthy relationship with it? And to go back to the documentary, um, when it came out, I did receive some, some backlash for, for being an honest friend. And so many people messaged me. I had TikTok videos of me going viral on uh, you know, millions and millions of views and people writing mean things to me on Instagram and saying all of this stuff. And people were messaging me saying, are you okay? Like, you know, what's going on? Are you all right? And yes, it hurt. Yes, it's not nice to see or read, but I was okay. And the truth is that I made a priority to make my inner life strong. And I had parents that really instilled that in me and that if you go for anything in life, people are always going to say things about you and you have to make that strong. And so I think we're living in a world now where social media really has taken over. And I, you know, again, to go back to my little cousins, I'll be at dinner with them and and you know they spend the whole night on TikTok, Snapchat, all of these things, and 
So I think it's so important that we instill in our family members, in our friends, in our children, in, in each other, that when we're scrolling on social, you're getting the smallest glimpse into somebody's life, right? You're seeing a picture, you're normally seeing, you know, if it's a video, you're seeing a small highlight. In a documentary, you're getting a 90 minute glimpse into somebody's story. But the truth is that none of us are living each other's life. And so we have to be conscious of not comparing and seeing the beauty in us. And we're all beautiful and unique in our own way. And I touched a lot about this in the book and talking about just having that strong inner life. And when that's strong, then you truly can face um, anything that comes your way. What, what do you mean when you say inner life? Just um, to be clear. So, yeah, so your inner life is is I talk a lot in the book about it being your spiritual life. It's the things, you know, even if it's not, if you don't have a spiritual life, um, it could be through just being still and speaking positive thoughts over yourself instead of negative ones. Um, so when those thoughts come, when I was in high school, I struggled a, a lot with um, self-esteem around appearance. And I would tell myself things like, oh, you you don't look good or that's why you you know you never have a boyfriend because the other girls in in the class are prettier than you and and i would literally tell those things to myself to a point where i really started to believe it and um and it's a lie right and so we have to replace those negative thoughts um with with positive ones and um and it takes time but but it is possible and and that's where i think again relationships important you mentioned you know with the surgeon general's report the other report too is that we're in a loneliness epidemic so it's we're more connected than ever but we're more disconnected than ever and we need encouragement from others too so i think having encouragement from others strengthens our inner life and then i think also um replacing negative thoughts with positive ones finding a spiritual life whether that's through meditation for me i go for long walks and put on my music and and kind of get centered that way but um there are many many ways and, and Midge, you were telling me earlier that you feel like the last several years the airwaves the you know the the world has been filled with pollution and noise and uh words that that just are, are, are destroying us mentally what do you mean by that in the movement to destigmatize mental health we placed it in this medical box where we said, something's wrong with you. There's something wrong with your mind. The issue lies within yourself. And we chose to ignore all of the environmental issues and factors that can be contributing to what you're actually feeling and producing these feelings within you. So you have someone who says, I'm experiencing anxiety. And we go, okay. Ignore that real wages and real income has been declining since the 70s. Ignore that ordinary life for an American is so much harder than it has been traditionally. Ignore that our youth is fighting an existential crisis, that's the climate crisis. Ignore that our society refuses to respond to children being shot in schools and that homophobia is on the rise and anti-Semitism is on the rise. We say ignore all these factors there's something in your mind that you're struggling with. And I think that's so neglectful because we're not addressing the root of the problem. We're only saying, here's the way to respond to it. Let's increase mental health, mental services, healthcare mental services. Let's get cognitive behavioral therapy going. Let's get prescriptions, let's increase screenings. And those are fantastic, fantastic resolves, but you'll never actually reach the entire demographic that you're thinking about if you don't look at the root causes. <clears throat> I hadn't thought of that. Um, Glenn, what do you think? I think that um, I've always felt that with all our evolution, we're not going to grow another finger or another toe, that our evolution is going to be in our brain. And I think what we are experiencing now is affecting the evolution of our brains. And I think it's easy to forget that we still have our very primitive amygdala, which is fight, flight, or freeze. And it's still a very, very, um, uh, it's, it's, it's right there. Um, you say what we're experiencing, what are you referring to? Well, I, I can only speak personally. Um, I've been incredibly affected by what's been going on, not only with COVID, 
but everything political in this country, you know, because there's so much that is so deeply upsetting. We, we haven't evolved in or to be able to absorb the amount of information that comes into us every day. It is relentless. And even on my phone or whatever, you know, I mean, I have 11,000 things on my phone and most of them are, are I haven't read, you know, because I can't. It's just too much. It's too much, you know. So um, I, th I think if we acknowledge who we are as, as homo sapiens, you know, and what we're capable of and to nurture from that, from that point, I think a lot, there are two things I want to say when you said that it, that how could you say to somebody like Selena Gomez, oh, how could you possibly feel that you're not good enough or there's something wrong? I feel, I've always felt that my artists of any kind, I call us the alien nation, um, that, that some of us are, you know, might have more antennae than other people and you might be incredibly affected, um, but that's why you do what you do. That informs your, your art but it can be a very difficult place to be. I think of my friend Robin Williams, who was always on the edge. I think it's some of these people who are dealing with really deep you know, mental health issues that have given us some of the most incredible art and experiences. And, and um, to, to acknowledge that um, is incredibly Im important. But I still struggle every day with, with how am I, you know, where am I supposed to be in this, in this melee of negativity? I, I think of us, you know, we have, a, we have a body politic. I think everything that is pumped into it is like pumping into our, nerv into our collective nervous system. And I feel as a, you know, I feel personally responsible for what I do and what, I, what it is that I am pumping into that that nervous system because it, it all adds up. To call it information overload is to grossly understate it, right? Um, Chelsea, TikTok's algorithms as of a month ago, they were still pushing suicide, if you can imagine this, suicide related content to vulnerable teens. It is used by 150, Amer 150 million Americans. Half the country is literally on TikTok. They were on Capitol Hill defending themselves like a month ago. What can be done from a policy perspective to get the reins around social media? I think it's not only a question of um, regulation, and there are different um, pieces of both legislation and regulation being considered, particularly in California and Europe right now, around time limits for um, children under the age of 18 on social media, on kind of the, the pace at which kind of the feed is fed to you. So to slow it down so that if you are um, you know, 14 and your brain is not fully developed and you're even kind of less equipped to consume information than kind of any of us um, here are this evening um, who are north of 14, you know, that it is slowing down and slowing down not kind of a little bit, but slowing down the feed substantially. So I think there are lots of very smart people who are thinking about what can we do to better protect children, to protect privacy, to protect freedom of speech, um, and where, you know, in the middle of all of those important priorities, kind of in the middle of that Venn diagram, like where the right answers are. Um, and hopefully um, we'll see real leadership as we often have uh, in issues that relate to the digital space from California and Europe and the rest of us, bluntly, will get dragged along um, and our children will benefit too um, because we, we need to be better partners to parents than we have been. But a lot of people have a hard time understanding how television stations, for example, can't just put any old thing on the air and social media companies can. That, that just doesn't really compute in a lot of people's minds. Should they be held to the same standard? I, cert they? I certainly think they should be, but the Supreme Court didn't necessarily agree uh, recently. And so for me, I would wish that the Supreme Court um, would have made a different ruling recently um, and would wish kind of that their collective jurisprudence 
when they were serving on lower courts, maybe indicated they would be receptive to arguments like the one that you just gave a nod to. Um, but I do not think that that is uh, likely. Um, but I do think that in California and in Europe, uh, we could see greater protections for children on some of the more technical things, but also on some of the more content fronts. Um, because I, I do agree that if you can't show something on television, you shouldn't be allowed to show it on Meta or Snapchat or Twitter or YouTube or TikTok. With that in mind, what's your social media strategy? How do you, how do you operate with that in mind? I only have Instagram, so for me, that's what feels manageable. And um, if it feels like too much, too much scrolling, my mind feels clouded, I just take a break. Um, so I just won't go on it for a day or, or two days. And um, I think to kind of go back to what I was saying before, it's not comparing and understanding that you're just seeing a small glimpse um, into everybody's life. And then it can be great because you can see, you know, what people are up to. You can stay in touch and, um, you know, read information that you care about, follow who you want to follow. And, um, yeah. And then if it's too much, it just, again, you know, don't go on it. It's really hard for my industry because in the women's game, most athletes make their money via marketing and branding. So like Alex Morgan, I'm, she's probably the most known, or Rapino, Megan Rapino, most of their income in the year comes from their social media and their marketing agreements. So it's this weird dichotomy where it's like, this is not great for you, but it's also incredible for you. <laughs> um, so, so you really have to think about how much authenticity are you giving? I don't like to be myself on social media. <laughs> don't? No. Who are you? I made her up. <laughs> well, because if you think about it, you know, you open yourself up to a lot of love, but you also open yourself up to a lot of criticism. And why would I tell you who I am to love or criticize, um, if you think about it, from a sports perspective? I try to keep it essentially just my sports or just my branding opportunities. Like you don't know that much about my life or who I am. I don't post a lot of funny videos or stories telling you about my day. Um, I keep that close to home. But other women in my league have taken the other approach and they show everything about themselves. And it's been really, really advantageous for their bank accounts. What do you for that? <laughs> I love it for them as long as it's, it's something that they find easy to manage and as long as something it's not too damaging to, to their psyche, but it's worked for a lot of people, but I've also seen it come on you know, the negative side, where you do receive a lot of criticism, where you have a really horrible take about something that you didn't think through. You post a video that's not very appropriate, maybe for the audience that women's soccer currently has, and you get a lot of bashlack for that, and that's really affected their psyche as well, so it's a really, really temperamental thing to kind of balance, and you have to decide what is best for you. What do you think, Glenn? You're looking at these <laughs> young ladies. Has like, anybody seen my Instagram? Um, <laughs> no. Oh my God. Well, it was it. I mean, I was so naive that I didn't realize. Oh, I realize now because now we're in the era of influencers. I remember when I first heard that word. Um, and people who are influ the big influencers have people. That's all they do for them, is post. They don't do their personal posting very rarely. So um, that was kind of a comfort in a way. I'm not gonna spend my money that way right now, no. Um, so I decided whatever I post is gonna be, um, you know, just some very tiny thing from my life if I feel like it. And um, like I put up a, a um, clothesline in my backyard. <laughs> and that was, I said, this is very cool. That's you know? your post. <laughs> yeah, I posted it. I said, look at, and then I thought, oh my God, look at your pants. You look like you're huge. Your pants are, are hanging from your, your, oh, it was kind of funny. And I get, you know, when you, when you kind of, in a weak moment, start reading comments, um, a lot of them are, you seem like a real person, <laughs> which is also And funny. how does that affect your mental health, this whole, this whole thing? I have to be very Careful with it, really careful, careful. I can't, I, I, I mean, we all go into the Instagram hole, that's what I call it, 
Like you start looking at all the things and all of a sudden two hours have gone by or an hour has gone by. And you think, oh my God, oh my God, I've just wasted two hours of my life. But it's interesting kind of because you see what other people are, are doing and, and in a way, but I, I, have, I, I can't do that. I can't do that a lot. I find it very, very uh, um, counterproductive. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on TikTok. Um, I'm not on Snapchat. Why? Because I, I am who I am. Um, I, I say the same things in public as I do in private. Like I can't act to save my life. Like everything I feel is really evident on my face um, and in my words, both their substance and tone. Uh, so. I start with that because I am very comfortable communicating um, in in words, and so kind of the I guess older social media platforms felt kind of easily accessible to me to be able to be my authentic self. Um, I am fiercely protective of my children's privacy; they are the most important part of my life. I would never show a picture of their um, kind of faces or our family's faces. Um, and it would feel just weird to me to be on Instagram, a visual media where you're sharing whether small moments of your life or big moments of your life and, and to not show actually the most important part of my life. So maybe if I had Midge's ability to like create the avatar of Chelsea Clinton, but for me, it just would feel um, inauthentic. Uh, and, and I think also I'm mindful of my childhood uh, prepared me, though, in many ways for social media. Um, the day after I was born, I was on the cover of the Arkansas newspapers because my father was the governor of Arkansas. Like, I never knew what it was like to have anonymity. Like, people talked to my parents and to me in the grocery store outside church, at my softball games, in airports, and restaurants. Um, everything that people say to me on social media today, they say to me in person, or they have said to me in person, all of the most kind of extraordinarily, like awkwardly complimentary things, the most like grotesque, vile, hateful, violent things, like all of it has been said to me in person. And much of it was said to me in person, like before I was old enough to drive. Um, and so I think, thankfully, I didn't have to learn how to navigate the emotions of the anonymous comments um, because I have always had people whose names I don't know, who I'd never seen before, who I probably would never see again, come up and say to me, like, oh, like, your mother is my hero, or like, I really wish your mother had aborted you because, like, wouldn't it be great if you weren't here? And you're like, oh gosh, like I'm eight. I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> um, and so I thankfully, the, the online stuff um, with all of its kind of glory and gore um, was just like a larger version of what my life had always been. And so I didn't have to learn how to navigate that. And I think I thankfully have not had to learn how to like not fall down the rabbit hole of Instagram because I'm just not on it. Um, but I do hope that my experiences can really help my children when they are old enough, um, which is way in the future. Um, How old are they? Eight, six, and three. Um, like maybe when they're 15, I'll let them have like social media, maybe. Um, and I know you're all like, oh, you're gonna cave, and no, I'm really not. <laughs> um, because I hope that my experiences can help them understand why it is important that they wait and why it is important that they are responsible online citizens for themselves, for their friends, for their community, and for strangers alike. With a thousand sweet kisses when you're born, I'll expire. With a thousand sweet kisses when you're born, I'll expire. Cut meat.
down. I'm gonna send a flood to drown them out. I'm brave, I'm bruised, I'm who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, cause here I I want to come back to Glenn and this question, how we can ensure that mental health resources and support systems are accessible, and you've begun making them accessible through your own work. Talk about how that's working. Well, um, it's been a real fight. Um, I live in a community in Montana, had a nonprofit community hospital, had a CEO who was heard saying that no one with mental illness would ever come into that hospital. They did not want them near the hospital. Um, they, so we got together. Um, we have a very, very um, active group uh, led by these two amazing women, both of them from the, med from the medical profession. Um, it started, we started our fight by, um, well, way back we, we met with the chief of police, with people from hospitals from all over the state. Um, because people were be, um, kids, anyone who had any kind of psychological break was put in handcuffs in the back uh, seat of a sheriff's car and driven two or three hours away to a hospital who, where they might find help. Nothing in our community. Uh, so we started to, to agitate and we wrote a letter that broke the issue open. Um, the, the paper, luckily, is, has been on our side. We, in the dead of winter in Montana, were, um, we made posters and we, and we um, uh, agitated outside of the hospital. Um, then, and we just, we just met with a brick wall. Um, then, because this CEO had, had engendered a toxic work environment, they finally had a vote and 92% of the doctors and nurses voted no confidence. And he left. Um, we want to know how much his severance pay was. And we have a lawyer who's kind of still interested in that. Um, but where we are now is uh, we finally, finally um, got a hearing with the board. The board was full of bull um, then we, with, a, with the interim uh, CEO, we went again and made our, our case. One of our, our group has lost two of his daughters to mental, because of mental illness and never had a place in that community to, for them to get help. I think it was almost two weeks ago, we, we, were, we had a follow-up meeting at the hospital and for the first time, we were told that they're gonna have a 12 bed psych unit in the hospital. They had, yeah, <laughs> it's big, but it won't happen till, you know, it's not gonna be tomorrow. They had contracted, this is interesting, because I think everybody, we have to fight on a community basis because, I mean, basically we all know somebody could have a break, somebody needs help, as, as Eris will underline, there's no place to go. You have to, you know, you know, Ideally, every community in this country should have a community health care place, and it should be attached to a hospital if there's a hospital there, because there's always, most of the time, they're comorbidities, and they need to be seen in the emergency room before they go into whatever, uh, you know, wherever they go, hopefully, to a bed. I've learned a lot. I didn't know anything about that kind of thing. I, I have huge respect for these, for the women who, one of them, uh, uh, Beth Sir, she has all the data, all the data from all the different hospitals. Every single hospital in Montana has a psych unit except ours. And you see how do they work, what's been good, what's best practices. The hospital wanted to bring a, a for-profit uh, group and put um, a, the place where they would send people who are having, you know, real uh, mental health issues three miles away from the hospital at a place that they are going to redo next to the Safeway. Not good. It's not best, best practices. That, um, that's not going to happen now. Um, so we have, we're still in a situation 
where most of the people come in, they go into the ER, and if there's a bed, they can stay there, but it's, it's they can't, I mean, it's just, it's, there's really no place yet, but there will be. But the thing that's an eye opener is how much of a fight it's been. And, but the thing is, I'm always saying, let's have a community meeting. Let's, let's you know, let's have an open mic. <laughs> let's have people come in and say what happened to their family. I mean, I'm, you know, but I think we're, we're now on, maybe hopefully on the other side, where people are understanding the importance to the community. Um, and it will eventually happen. It's not gonna happen fast enough, but it's been a real eye opener how much of a, of a real struggle it's been. People can say, yes, we need this, but you actually have to get in the trenches to make it happen. Just one final thought here with the rest of our panel, a final thought from each of you. Um, how have you seen the mental health conversation change over the last, say, decade? And what gives you hope going forward? I think it's become something that we can no longer ignore. Everywhere we look, it's a conversation. And what gives me hope is that we are seeing changes be made. I work in the entertainment industry. It's a conversation on every set. And that gives me hope, is that there is progress, there is change. People are aware, people are open, people are compassionate. And I've seen a lot of change. Mitch? It's changed a lot in my industry as well. And the stigma for us has almost reversed completely. It's really frowned upon if you're not doing active work to take care of your mental wellness. Everyone on my team has a sports psych, except I think maybe two or three of us. And we were berated the other day. And they, my coach was like, you don't want to be mentally fit <laughs> for, for the game. And so it's, it's things like that that is, it's really positive. It makes, you, it makes you think, you know, we're headed in the right direction. It's, a it's not just a conversation, but it's actively encouraged. It's something that when we go speak with younger teams and girls who come to our games, they ask us about what's your routine? Do you meditate before the game? Like, like what is your strategy? And they're really, really interested in maintaining that level of mental health and wellness for themselves because it's directly correlated to performance-based. Um, so it's, it's really exciting to see an industry-wide approach, not just from the players pushing for this, but from the coaches and from the league. Uh, our league put in a new policy, which is you have a mental health leave of absence if you really, really need it. And you get to take three weeks off and leave your club, no consequences in the sense of your contract won't be renewed. You're probably not gonna start when you get back and you, <laughs> you may not make all the rosters, but, but there's, there's no negative consequences from that alone. So it's really, really exciting to see everyone across the industry really rally behind something that's this important. That's tremendous, unheard of 10 years ago, truly, right? So much of my earlier career, you know, as an academic, as an advocate, kind of mental health was something completely separate from kind of physical health and, and well-being, despite the fact that in the Constitution and the mission statement of the World Health Organization, you know, more than 75 years ago, now health is defined as being a complete state of kind of physical and mental health and well-being. So even though kind of there was that kind of recognition and, and codification, you know, at, at WHO from its inception, um, so many of its own programs and other programs kind of at the, at the global and also, you know, national and local levels were largely focused only on, on physical health and often kind of quite purposefully to the exclusion of or kind of the lessening of, of mental health. And we have seen that, you know, dramatically shift. Um, you asked kind of about what gives me hope. I mean, certainly all of these stories give me hope. I mean, Glenn's, you know, just doggedness of like, you know, wanting there to be more community meetings so she can keep talking about this and keep finding more people who understand why their community, you know, deserves a mental health clinic attached to hospitals so there can be appropriate triage I find you know incredibly inspiring because we know that so many of these challenges have to be tackled at a local level and then you know, we heard clearly the testimonies of what has shifted in kind of entertainment and sports and um, with all kind of due respect that's hugely important for 
the two of you and your colleagues and your cohort, but it's arguably more important to young people who look at entertainment and sports for role models, for what's acceptable, for what's cool. And hopefully now like mental health wellness is cool. And so hopefully younger people are gonna think like, well, that's just something that they should be doing too. My one part of kind of concern is not only do we not continue to really listen to what the research is showing us in terms of where we're allocating dollars, um, whether it's kind of from kind of venture capital risk perspective, although hopefully um, Harris and Jim are gonna change that, but also kind of from you know, public dollars, whether kind of from Medicaid or federally qualified health centers, is that even in those conversations, it is so often about kind of the highest acuity of need, understandably. But we're then missing other things that we really should be focused on. Like two thirds of kids in American public elementary and middle schools are in schools where they don't have a school nurse five days a week. Where they have a school nurse one, two, maybe three days a week. That is outrageous in the context of this conversation or in the context of the last few years. Or even fewer kids are in schools where there's a clinical social worker every day. And so we really need to be having these conversations about what we need to be doing for people who are in acute moments of crisis with very clear needs that have to be addressed through the medical system. And also we need to be thinking about kind of our public health response as inclusive of all of our public and community architecture to ensure that particularly for kids, we are meeting them where they are and we are supporting our children and their families to be able to have the resilience to hopefully grow up and fight climate change and gun violence and everything else so that hopefully their children need a little bit less of it but still have the resources that everyone deserves in the richest country that has ever existed in the history of the world. And when are you declaring your candidacy? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no. Thank you all so much. To, to bring us home, we're not done yet. To bring us home, I want to call up Dr. Kim, Dr. Jim Kim, former head of the World Bank, head of Dartmouth College. <laughs> done incredible work, as you've heard, on TB and AIDS, and he's got some serious thoughts on mental health. You, you know, the story that when I heard it from Harris about his brother dying uh, uh, from long history of battling bipolar disease, it, 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 turned, it, it probably was that he was um, getting treated by five different people who gave him five different medic medications, and that should never happen. There should be coordination, there should be triage, there should be some kind of system in place. And so, um, uh, very proud to be part of this team. And uh, what we're responding to is a situation that's just awful everywhere. So one of my, uh, uh, one of my teachers in this world is Tom Insel, former head of the National Institute of Mental Health. And Tom says that in this country, not, not in Haiti, not, not in Rwanda, but in this country, only 40% of people with a diagnosed mental illness get any treatment at all. And of that 40% that get any treatment at all, only 40% of them get what he calls minimally acceptable treatment. And then of those that get minimally acceptable treatment, about a third get fully better. So if you've been doing the math, about 5% of people in this country where there are more therapists, more treatments than any other country in the world, about 5% get fully better. So I, you know, I, I first um, uh, started looking into this, uh, uh, this, this issue. Uh, you know, my, many of my teachers, uh, Arthur Kleinman, my, my teacher for my uh, uh, PhD in anthropology, was a psychiatrist, and he had been urging me, you know, for 35 years to get more involved in mental health. And I have to say, I'm ashamed that I didn't take his advice. Because when I started looking into it, it, it really shocked me. It shocked me how bad the system uh, was, and not just in developing countries, but, but everywhere. And so it reminded me of a saying, you, you probably have heard others uh, use some version of it. The, the original um, quote was from Leon Trotsky, uh, the, the Russian politician and revolutionary. And the quote is, revolution is impossible until it's inevitable. And so how can we foment a revolution uh, in uh, tackling issues around uh, mental illness? Uh, I, I, I want to give you a sense of why 
I feel so optimistic that this can be done by telling you the story uh, of another situation that was deemed utterly impossible until it became inevitable, and that was the story of HIV treatment in Africa. Now, Chelsea knows this story, frankly, better than I did. She wrote her PhD dissertation on, the, on uh, one of the uh, organizations that came up out of the need to treat HIV, the Global Fund. But uh, I, I just want to give you a sense of how absolutely um, uh, uh, unanimous the opinion was that it is impossible to treat HIV in Africa. Now, the vast majority of people living with HIV were in Africa. We had discovered these new treatments called highly active antiretroviral therapy that um, led to what uh, was called the Lazarus effect of HIV treatment, where people who looked like they were dead, and you know, there were people in the United States who had sold all their belongings uh, because uh, they, they thought they were going to die from HIV. And these medicines came along, and literally, people were rising from the dead. It was a miracle treatment, and HIV in the United States went from being the most stigmatized disease, even more stigmatized in mental health, to being a, just another chronic uh, illness. Uh, luckily, there were lots of people who, who got involved in, uh, in this issue, and I'll never forget, Chelsea, I think you were still at Stanford. Uh, we went to the Harlem office of your dad, and he had just stepped out of, uh, he, he had just left the presidency in 2001. And uh, he asked us what he should do going forward. And we said, well, we really need to do something about HIV treatment. And uh, remarkably, he, he did not question us. He did not um, uh, ask, well, if it's possible, is it doable? Uh, but we told him very specifically, what you need to do is you need to help us drop the price of the drugs, which is possible if we make them through the generic manufacturers in India and China. But more importantly, you have to protect us from the research-based pharmaceutical industry who are going to want to kill us because they do not want us um, moving generic drugs to places like Africa. He did both of those things. And the price of HIV drugs went from about $15,000 a year to about $75 a year. Right? And so that wasn't the only thing we had to do. And, and what, when I was at the World Health Organization, I had to set up a system where we could create a global food and drug administration that could verify the quality of those drugs so that they could be used everywhere in Africa. Uh, when I did that at, at, um, at WHO, the research-based pharmaceutical industry insisted that the director general fire me because I was, uh, I was playing around with patents and that this would be terrible for the entire industry. So uh, you know, the point is that it seemed it's completely impossible because you can't lower the price of drugs, you can't get the supply chain right, you can't possibly do the procurement, but we did. And today, 30 million people are on treatment for HIV, 17 million in Africa. And I, I have to tell you that that decision, and, and, and one of the heroes of the story is President George W. Bush, who announced the PEPFAR program, which was so completely um, uh, unexpected. None of us expected that, that President Bush would, would get on board at that point. So this was 2003 that he had made that announcement. President Clinton had been wor working with us for a couple of years already. And, and it saved a continent. I mean, if I put my World Bank uh, finance hat on, uh, if we had decided, uh, uh, as everyone had, had, had uh, advised us to do, to turn our backs on Africa, that continent would have collapsed. And as it was collapsing, there would have been refugees going all over the world trying to get treatment. It would be the most natural thing. So given that we've done that, what can we do now to foment the revolution in mental health care? Again, going back to my, my, my friend Tom Insel, uh, if the, book, the book Healing, we have copies of it here. Uh, it's an amazing book. And it, it's essentially a mea culpa for the time that he spent at the National Institute of Mental Health focusing mostly on basic science. He doesn't say that that was wrong. He just says that he missed the, the, he, 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 he missed the core, which was people need to get better. We have to find ways for people to get better. Because what did we learn from HIV? If people get better, stigma goes down. So if we can go from 5% of people getting better to 50%, 60% of people getting better, which he assures me is possible, if we could do that, that wouldn't just change uh, the mental health world, it would change the entire world. 
Can we do it? Well, it's, it's the moment. Uh, in that book, you'll see that treatments are better. There are things like transcranial magnetic stimulation that we never had before. There are things that we can do now uh, that actually can make people better. Ketamine for short-term depression. There's so many new treatments. If we do this and do this together, we really feel that the revolution can be at hand. So I hope we've gathered here today a small group of committed souls that will take on this task of bringing about the revolution that the people living with mental health deserve and have deserved for a very long time. At our last event, right, I met, I met a person who uh, was uh, close friends with a friend of mine, Eric Sawyer, who w was one of the leaders of ACT UP. And I was talking to him and he goes, oh, Eric's my friend. He called Eric right then and, the, and, and what Eric said was, oh, so uh, mental health needs an ACT UP and that's just what we need. Because you know, the, what, we, what we've learned is that politicians get embarrassed. And if you can embarrass a politician effectively, you can have these kinds of changes where, you know, hold them to their word. But it, it doesn't happen easily. You, you, you have to be willing to, uh, uh, to do some outrageous stuff. And the AIDS activists were willing to do that. And the question is, can we find people who would be willing to do it in mental health? No time better than right now. It has been an extraordinary panel. Can you show them some more love, please? One more time. Thank you. Like a comet pulled from orbit as it passes the sun. Like a seed dropped by a skybird in a distant world.